we've once again managed to get our hands on the legendary Lotus 110 TT bike. And in the hands of Chris Boardman, this Mike Burroughs designed beast was a race winning, record breaking icon that still stands up to date, still looks cutting edge. Now we previously tested it out on the road, but this time we've come to a wind tunnel because a wind tunnel offers a much more controlled environment that will give us much more accurate data to find out just how fast this is compared to modern bikes. It's, it's the reason why planes, cars and missiles are, are tested in wind tunnels. Anyhow, we have a video up on the GCN main channel of the Lotus versus the Orbea Orca Aero uh, modern aero bike and also the cutting edge TT bike, which is a Canyon Speedmax. So check that out if you've not seen it already. But in this video, we're going to go into much more depth and nerdy detail on the results of this test with the help of Dr. Xavier Disley from Aero Coach. So, well, strap yourself in, put your Warhammer away, pause that episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine and we'll get to it. Oh, it's going to be so good. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, Zav is the head of Aero Coach, who are a consultancy that works with top bike and wheel brands to optimize their products and also work with top athletes and world tour teams to make them faster. Thanks for helping us out today, Zav. Um, before we get on to sort of the numbers of the, of the testing that we've done today, I just want to know, like, in your expert opinion, what do you, what do you make of the, of the Lotus 110? So the, the Lotus 110, as we know, is an iconic bike. Um, and it really kind of changed everyone's perceptions of what an aero bike could do and, and could look like. And it set records all over the place. Um, and I think that lots of features on the bike really helped kind of kick off a new wave of aerodynamic improvements in cycling. And uh, as we know, the Lugano Charter of the UCI kind of stopped that yeah, yeah. <laughs> after a while. Um, but the uh, things I like about it, in particular the forks, are really cool because they, the profile on those, if you have a very close look at them, are, are really, um, really nicely done. And the, the way the head tube integrates with the top tube and the rest of the bike um, is, is great. And there's, there's integration everywhere, wherever you look. So whether it's the seat post, where the top tube flows into how the seat post, uh, well, the, the seat clamp attaches to the top of the seat post, or whether it's the specially shaped area around the front and the bottom bracket to deflect the airflow around the bottom bracket. All of these are things that you would find on a modern bike if someone wanted to go for that kind of shape. Um, so it's, it's really impressive. And these bikes are still being ridden today. So they hold up um, and people are not going slow on them. The thing, it, it looks, it just looks so cool. Like it's still that, like, like even like when we were wheeling it in, a guy, a random guy walked past and was like, Ah, oh, looks proper cool. Like he's like, oh, nice bike. And he's like, you know, you just don't really get that. Even you know, with many bikes, it's it's astounding for a bike that is that old. But one of the things is people always say that it is like a compromised version of the 108, because mm -hmm. it you know it's got the brakes and all the gubbins and all the cables on it, and the designs change. It doesn't have the mono fork yes. that the other one had. Um, and so, it's what we would love if if there is anyone watching this who has a 108 track bike that is prepared to let us test it, then please, yeah, get in contact. Write in the comments below, contact us on social media, whatever. But yeah, we'd, we'd love to, to see how that one gets on. Um, so let's get on to the, the numbers. Sure. Guess, how did it perform? So we tested it bike only against the Orbea, and we found that as a bike only, it was only half a watt quicker yeah. at 45k an hour with a, with a Your Sweep only half a watt quicker than the road bike, um, which does sound surprising. But then when you, when you look at the bike a bit more closely, the front end, I think, is the thing that, that, that causes problems. So the frame itself is fine. Um, obviously, it's got a disc and tri-spoke, which are, which are quite nice, but um, it's the front end that's an issue. With the retro front end that the bike had, it had round tubes everywhere. There were exposed cables. There were big, chunky brake levers and things. Um, and I think that that's what's costing it. Um, and the reason why it isn't any much, you know, any, any faster than just half a watt over the road bike. Um, when we did it bike only against the Canyon Speedmax, um, the Speedmax was 3.4 watts quicker than the Lotus. It's not Lotus much, though, is it? At 45k. No, it isn't. And, and the slower you go, the less 
um, that you, the less of an advantage in wattage terms you yeah. get, the faster you go, the more you get. But 45K is kind of like a good average for a very fast TT. So um, three and a half watts, 3.4 watts is nothing. And it also means that the Canyon Speedmax compared to the Orbea road bike, there was less than four watts between the two. Not a huge amount. But, but one of the things is like, and this is one of, you know, testing, testing a bike just on its own in the wind tunnel, it does answer some questions. It does give you some useful information, but obviously a bike doesn't ride itself. Like, it, it, yeah, we know it's not the whole system. Um, and so that's why we did, you know, test with the rider as well, but one and one of the things the issues with it probably with like you see with the canyon is it, with all the cockpit gubbins at the front that's not like that aero but it enables the rider to get into like much more aero position right absolutely if you took the tt by the canyon's tt bike and you took away the aero bars you would save loads of drag if you were just testing it bike only but exactly as you say you're not moving the bike down the road with no one on it you have to put the rider on and we saw that there was, a, there was a dramatic difference in your position on the Lotus compared with your position on the Canyon. The position on the Canyon was a lot higher, closer, narrower. Um, so the, well, the, well, the other interesting thing is, is it's, that's a UCI legal position now. Fine, okay. Because of the, the, I've got it, I've measured it. And with the way, because now you can have your angle higher. Yes. On your arm extensions. Yes. I'm UCI, I'm UCI legal. Yeah, so, that, so Ollie's in height category two and it's changed now. Yeah. They've added an extra height category, which means you get an extra two centimeters to, to play with height wise. Yeah. And the angle you can have up to 30 degrees now. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, uh, so, I mean, both of that is UCI legal. The Lotus is UCI legal as well, but the, the retro position on the Lotus, very low quite stretched out you know you were you were very much reaching for it yeah. your, your hands were quite far apart as well i mean i'm able to do it in the tunnel but that, that the other thing is i can feed back is that 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 is not a sustainable position for me out on the road like i would really struggle the perceived effort is way more like i'm struggling to hold that position whereas the canyon's like super comfy so the, so what we found then that compared with the lotus the canyon speed max the more modern aero position was just over 25 watts better at 45 kilometers an hour. But then that's purely from an aero point of view. From a comfort perspective, if we took you out on the road and you rode it, I would expect that, to, that gap to grow. Yeah. Um, so that sort of 25 watts worth of aerodynamic drag may be coupled with 15 watts worth of power loss yeah. on the Lotus because it's so uncomfortable. So suddenly you're looking at, you know, maybe up to 40 watts or something difference between the two bikes. Um, because it's so important to make sure that you can actually ride the bike in a comfortable position. Yeah. It's all very well being aerodynamic on its own, but you need to be able to ride the bike outside. And so that, that, that you know, the compromise between super low drag and comfort is, is really important. Yeah. I, I mean, something else that's is quite intriguing is obviously the, when you're doing the wind tunnel test, it's isolating just the aerodynamic drag of the bikes. So it's removing things like drivetrain efficiency. It's also removing the big one, which is tire rolling resistance. And I suspected that could have been a big factor in the test we saw when we originally did it outdoors, because the Orbea had a modern fast rolling Pirelli tubeless tires on it, like you know, a good setup, low rolling resistance tires and wide tires as well. It had 26 mil tires on um, when we tested it outdoors. And the contrast is that on the, on the Lotus, it's got really narrow, like 21 millimeter, really like old tubulars. Like what are they? I think they were 19 mil Conti podiums. 19 millimeter continental podiums. Yeah, like butyl inner tubes in yes. those, slow, yeah. right? Like now, knowing what you know about rolling resistance, because you've done a lot of rolling resistance testing and the, the aero differences we've seen today, what do you think? Because, well, before, well before, I just remember the results difference. I was 13 seconds quicker on the Orbea and Sai was a second quicker on the Lotus. So there's obviously margin for error in there, but, but like it was pretty close between the two. Sure, so what we found today, purely from an aerodynamic perspective, was there was a, a 16.3 watt difference between the Lotus and the Orbea. With a rider. With a rider on, okay? So um, yes, you're in a more aero position and what, the bikes we found were pretty similar, so you got a 16.3 watt advantage on the, on the Lotus. Now, if you think about, if we sort of start working back and uh, thinking about rolling resistance, the tubulars had butyl 
tubes sewn into them. And we know from the testing we've done in the past at 45K, which is our testing speed, that that is, could be you know, two or three watts per wheel compared with a nice tubeless setup. That's purely the inner tube. And then the tire casing itself makes a difference again. So if we take that 16 and so watts, it's eight watts per wheel, you take away two or three watts by having a butyl tube versus having tubeless sealant or a latex tube, suddenly you're on about five watts per wheel. And we know from the testing we've done that five watts per wheel or five watts per tire is, can be found even within the difference between modern tires, let alone a 19 millimeter tubular from back in the day to a very you know, modern kind of more racy tire. So I wouldn't be surprised if outdoors the Orbea was quicker, but just purely because of the tires. That's mad. Yeah. That's mad. I mean, well, I mean, the other thing I've got, I had a wax chain on it as well. Uh, <laughs> so there's probably, probably a couple of watts there as yeah. well. But like, um, yeah, it just shows you those little things can make more difference than a lot of people probably appreciate. Absolutely, yeah. Thinking about a 16 watt difference and then just taking away this bit here and this bit there and suddenly you've, you've outweighed it. Um, and you wouldn't have imagined that the road bike, regardless of what tyres it had, could be in some instances faster than a, a TT bike like the Lotus 110 outside, yeah. but something like tyres can make that difference. Yeah, I, the other interesting thing was is we tested at two speeds deliberately. So we did 45k an hour and we did 55k an hour. 45k an hour because that's the sort of time trialing speed we did when, when me and Sai rode the bikes out on the road and is a typical time trialing speed. But we did 55 because that is the legendary speed that Chris Boardman averaged when we did a record breaking Tour de France prologue. So at 55k an hour, what's the difference between the bikes? So when we tested at 55k, we found that compared uh, the, the speed max compared to the Lotus, there was a 46.9 watt advantage with the speed max compared with riding the Lotus. And if you compare the speed max to the Orbea, it was nearly 70 watts. So that's a lot. Now, the faster you go, the more watches you're gonna save, and yeah. these, these numbers get, you know. It gets exponential. It, 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 yeah, it gets, it gets silly sometimes when you go to things like team pursuit speeds and, yeah. and stuff like that. Um, but a, yeah, a 47 watt advantage from a modern TT bike to the Lotus, when you're traveling at professional speed, is night and day. You know, that's, that's not something you're gonna get back from having a good night's sleep or an energy gel or something. No, like that. that's huge. What would that translate as in time savings over a time um, trial distance? So if you were doing a, a 40 kilometer time trial, for example, in Tour de France, and you were traveling at 55K, swapping from the Canyon Speed Max to the Lotus 110, assuming wrong resistance is the same, you would save um, one minute, 15 seconds on the Canyon than you would do on the Lotus. Um, and as we've seen in years past, you know, you don't need one minute, 15 seconds to make a difference in Tour de France. It can be quite a lot less than that. No, um, so that is, a, yeah, it's a huge difference there. So what do, you, what do you make of Boardman's record speed then? Like, you know, that he achieved in, in Tour de France time trial, like 55k, I mean, compared to what a modern rider could do. It's, it, I mean, it's, it's crazy because yeah. you see sometimes riders getting close to, you know, 55, 54, 56k, but the idea that someone could have been giving up so much speed back in the day compared with a modern bike and yet still go that fast, it's incredibly impressive. Yeah. It's incredibly impressive. And, and we know that Chris Borman um, put out a lot of power back in the day, um, but he wasn't a massive rider. And yet a lot of the faster time trialists these days are very tall, strong riders like Filippo Ganna, Stefan Kung, those kind of riders. Um, but also at those high speeds, it does reward being very aerodynamic. So people like Primus Roglic or Remco Evenepoel can go quick. Um, and I think that Borman had a, a really nice you know, it was kind of sat a little bit in between the two. He was very, very strong, but he also had a very good knowledge of aerodynamics and, and a good aero position. Yeah, he's, um, I mean, oh yeah, basically it gives me more sort of respect for that time, but I'm also n knowing how much faster the modern UCI bikes are now and seeing that with all the kit as well, because then, you know, you're not factoring in skin suits mm -hmm. and all that stuff. You think, well, actually, if, if, some, if there was a, the right course and the right conditions, someone, could break that record, I think. That, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, which is an enticing, enticing prospect. Something that in, sort of fascinates me is, is the Canyon is UCI legal, mm -hmm. right? Even by the UCI rules, which changed last year. Uh, but the Lotus isn't. But 
with if you took modern engineering and the, the knowledge that we've gained in the last 25 years and the modern construction techniques and modern materials or whatever how could how would you know you make the lotus faster could you make it like a lot faster say than the canyon you reckon yeah i think that if you look at the bike as we had it today what we were discussing about how the exposed cables and the handlebars weren't helping um Removing all of those things, knowing what we know about aerodynamics and being able to integrate those into the frame, um, you would absolutely see an improvement. Um, not only that, but also construction techniques in terms of carbon fiber layup and how you engineer things like the head tube um, would mean that you could make a slightly narrower head tube, um, which uh, would be a nice way to improve the aerodynamics and also integrate more of the bike together. So you could have uh, a wheel that was designed particularly for the frame, for example, like a disc wheel or a front wheel. Um, and that's something that we see these days happening with a lot of the modern bikes is that all of the components around the bike are being designed in tandem. So you have handlebars that are integrated into it. You have wheels that are designed or involved in the design process. Um, so I think that you could definitely take that template and make something that's like quite a lot better out of it. Um, using yeah, both modern analysis techniques, but also your ability to mould better things or maybe 3D print certain components and, and, and parts to go on it. So I suppose that the, the nearest thing in the modern world to the, the Lotus bike is the Ventum, which is a triathlon yeah, bike. I forgot that. Which uh, has integrated storage in the top tube where the, you have the long top tube um, and there's like a removable um, drinks pack. Um, and I think that's, it's nice that people are using the Lotus design as a template um, to then create a more modern, a more modern bike out of it with you know more modern handlebars and things. But of all the sort of hyper bikes, the kind of you know weird and wacky designs out there, you know what would what would you know you like as best to most to see test? So I, I out of the out of the older retro bikes, I think that it's a shame really that Bianchi and Look haven't made. Um, the kind of bikes that they used to make because there were a lot of different models certainly bianchi were making some really crazy stuff um, back in the 90s uh, for their top riders and tts and um, the the look bikes as well with fairings all over the place uh, were really cool as well so i'd quite like to see some more of that you know what they've actually so i've been to the look uh, hq which is in um, uh, nevers i think that's how you say it in france they've got all the bikes They've, they've got like a room where they're just all in there. No one ever sees them, but they've got those bikes you're talking about. Yeah. Um, oh my, look, if you're watching, <laughs> you want us to test it, it'd be wicked. That would be cool, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, well, we'll see if they can. But uh, yeah, I'd love to see those bikes tested. Well, I think we'll, we'll end it there, but like, thanks so much, Sav, for your, for your time and like your expertise in running the, the tests. And also thanks again, Steve Grimwood absolute legend if you're passing Ipswich and you want to check out his bike museum um, or his bike shop by all means go uh, go check it out and give this video a thumbs up if, uh, if you want to say thanks to Steve and uh, we've got a load more wind tunnel content in the pipeline that we've filmed today so if you want to see that make sure you subscribe to GCN Tech and we'll uh, see you in the next one love you bye